It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 108, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Michael Phillips raises about three acres of fruit trees at Lost Nation Orchard in extreme northern New Hampshire. And while that's pretty cool, and while Michael is well known for his excellent books on organic orcharding, today we dig into the subject of his new book, Michael Risel Planet. Michael started his orchard on imperfect apple ground, something that forced him, or, or maybe it gave him the opportunity, to figure out what he needed to do to make his apple trees tick. And that led him to the fungal relationships between trees and soil organisms that transfer information, nutrients, and water, not just to individual plants, but through a field or plant population. In addition, mycorrhizae induce a systemic resistance to pests in the plants, and Michael helps us understand how that works and how we can take advantage of it. We dig into how this amazing fungal network actually functions, and how you can enhance and preserve its functioning in the orchard and in the vegetable field. Michael provides background information and practical tips on how to maintain and enhance mycorrhizal populations even when we have to till the soil, as well as how to make and use your own mycorrhizal inoculant for transplants and seeds. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production, vermontcompost.com, and by Small Farm Central. Providers of Member Assembler CSA management software. Member Assembler has the flexibility to serve the needs of the myriad of farmers' business models, as well as serving non traditional local food subscriptions like meat, fish, dairy, and fruit CSAs and CSFs. Smallfarmcentral.com. And by Farm Commons. Strong, resilient farm businesses are built on a solid legal foundation. Farm Commons provides practical legal resources to help farmers understand and respond to how the law affects them free guides, and tutorials available online at farmcommons.org. Michael Phillips, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Oh, I'm happy to be here, Chris. So glad that you could join us today from Groveton, New Hampshire, up in the Lost Nation region of New Hampshire. We were just talking before we started the show. Yeah, we're up here above the, what people would know as the White Mountain National Forest, where the presidential mountain range is, and there's a another island of national forest, and we're about 30 miles from Quebec. So it's, it's another part of the state that's quite different from down below. About what latitude are you at up there? Oh, not too far north of us. You hit that 45 degree latitude. So we're, we're in a happy place. We're all, we're ready for the climate change as it comes. We're <laughs> going to have it be in a sweet spot, I think. You own and operate Lost Nation Orchard, and I'd, I'd like to have you set the stage for our conversation today. And, you know, obviously you've got, this, you've got the book, Mycorrhizal Planet, coming out. We're going we're gonna to talk a lot about that, but I'd kind of like to ground that in your farming practice, if you can tell us a little bit about your operation. We have what would once have been known as a subsistence mountain farm, and this was settled by an Irish family in the 1800s. And when Nancy and I first walked down the driveway, there was a babbling brook, and there were deer over in the field edge. That, that would come to be an issue, but at the time, it was really beautiful. <laughs> it was very romantic, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, it was a farm that we could buy without losing ourselves in debt. I mean, it, it was a challenge as it was. It was not picked as ideal apple ground, and, and that's an interesting part of my path. Um, I came to realize I really like trees. I wanted to plant an orchard. I was associated with an orchard down the road here in Lost Nation. That was in the 90s, and I planted trees there, and I planted trees here on our home ground. So eventually, we lost that leased cider mill, and my home farm became my one center focus, and that, that was a good thing. One can only do so much. Um, I have three acres of trees here in three separate blocks. It's mostly apple. There's some pie cherries, some pears, some plums. Um, we're pretty far north. Peaches don't quite survive here. You can plant a tree and it might make it for a year or two, but then the cold comes and, and we've seen 30, 40 below. When we first moved here, we even saw 50 below. So it's a cold place. Um, besides the fruit trees, the other thing we do a lot with here are medicinal herbs. My wife, Nancy, is an herbalist and, and works to help people in the community and makes different preparations. And we dry herbs and sell those through her work and usually at herb conferences. So, so it's a good mix of different crops. You know, not every year is a bumper apple year, and there's always plenty to do. So with three acres of apple trees, what's your market for that? I primarily market out of our post and bean barn. So 
In one sense, I have an advantage. Anytime someone is crazy enough to grow organic apples, you get a lot of people thinking, I'd like to taste those apples. I'd like to tap into that. And I'm really the only grower in the state doing this. And though I am a long way on the beaten path, um, I have a big enough mailing list that enough people come on extended fall weekends to buy the crop. And it's working out. Part of it is, yes, I wrote the book, The Apple Grower, and yes, I wrote the book, The Holistic Orchard. So sometimes people will come up from Boston or down from Montreal, but it's mostly a local market, and that's what I set out to do. So that part's really satisfying. And are you making a living from the farm? I am making the typical New England living of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So some years my, my farm income might be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, but that's supplemented with writing and with consulting. And for a long, long time, I did carpentry. Um, my wife, Nancy, taught for a long, long time, kindergarten and first grade in a private school. So it's a combination of things. And that too kind of has its peaks each season where you get to do one thing versus another. And, and there's a, a rhythm to it that's nice. Tell me about how the medicinal herb farm fits in with the apple orchard. I know that on a lot of farms, when you have a lot of different enterprises, it, it can become a challenge to manage all of them because oftentimes they have conflicting needs. Are those are those two enterprises that fit pretty well together? At the scale that we're doing things, yes. And you're right. I mean, there are peak moments in the apple orchard. Pruning in the winter, well, that fits kind of readily. You're not dealing with green plants. Come the growing season, pretty much from green tip until about a month after petal fall and the blossoms come off the tree, there is a lot to do in the orchard. That's when you're facing down those insect and disease challenges and you're building up the fungal duff under the trees. But there's, there's a rhythm to the days and, and you get things done that you need to in terms of, of planting. One of the advantages of working with medicinal herbs is they are not all annual crops, nor are they all necessarily perennial crops that we have growing in our gardens. I mean, we have plenty of those, but there's also many wild plants that we can harvest for medicine. You know, a case in point, and, and this one is actually probably one of the more extreme ones I have time conflicts with, there's a wild fruit tree called the hawthorn. Hawthorn has those long spikes on it, and the, the blossoms and the young leaf clusters of hawthorn is a very valuable medicine for the heart. So going out to pick blossom clusters while you're studiously avoiding those thorns, uh, at the peak of when things are happening in the orchard and I'm starting to thin the crop, that gets a little tight right then and there because I, I only have three to five days to get those hawthorn blossoms picked. And that just means instead of maybe picking my goal of 80 pounds, I pick 40 pounds. But those are the types of things you balance. and. All in all, the interchange is nice because when the herbs really come on, the ones who are growing in the garden, well, that's July and August, and that's cruise time in the orchard. There's things you're doing, but it's in anticipation of the harvest. And once fall comes, the herbs start to have been at their peak, and they've been harvested and dried and made into medicine. And then I'm focused on apples until we do root crops, which come after the apples, and that's when I plant the garlic. So it's, it's enough to keep you very busy, but it, it also has kind of a sequence to what each is asking of you to do so that it fits. Now, you indicated that when you came to what became Lost Nation Orchard, you weren't necessarily thinking that you were going to be an apple farmer. How did that happen? Well, I knew I wanted to grow apples, and I was thinking more on the home orchard scale, more that approach. Then we had this opportunity to lease this 100-year-old cider mill. And there was two acres of orchard associated with that. We planted five more acres. And that really got me going. We were making products like Yankee apple butter and organic cider jelly and squishing and squishing lots of apples. And it was fall and people loved it. And I had a partner and we loved it. Um, that business folded because there was a new owner and that's a complicated story. And I'll just advise people out there, when you lease an apple orchard, don't have great expectations. <laughs> but other than that, 
the bug was lit under me. I wanted to do more of this. And so I had planted an acre here. It, it wasn't properly deer fenced while we ran that other orchard. But I came back and, and prepared more ground, put up more deer fence. Um, the three acres now, you know, in a, in a peak year here, we're looking at maybe 12, 1,600 bushels of fruit. Um, it's a fair amount. Biennialism is, is something that occurs with apples, and when you're doing this organically, it, it can be hard to thin enough so that you get a, a balanced annual crop. Um, that's just kind of the cycle. It's what it is. Bigger challenge now is the way spring is playing out, and when cold comes, even before the blossoms have opened, um, that's been affecting us here in New England and in, in the Midwest as well. But it's just working with trees, and I alluded to the fact that I was probably meant to be here in that it's not perfect apple ground. And by that, I mean my interest in understanding how trees, plants are healthy in nature, being able to take that, those insights and transfer them to a site where it's about as challenging as it gets. And I know most apple growers will tell you their site is as challenging as it gets. Um, it really put me on the spot in terms of figuring things out, being able to deal with weather patterns, and then finding the right words to convey those teachings so others could deal with the difficult challenges that are going to be on any one site. What were the biggest challenges that you faced on your site once you fenced the deer out? Well, apples are out there 12 months of the year. So you got the deers in the bowl in winter, and, and you just have to follow horticultural basics. You know, you wrap the trunks. But it's, it's the fungal diseases. It's fire blight, which is a bacterial disease. And it's also pests and how they cycle in and out each year. So at any given orchard site in the east, plum cuculeos, this little weevil that came out of the plum thicket, that was a vexing thing for organic growers all through the 70s, 80s, 90s. And at that point, the surround kale and play came out. And that every one of these has integrated components to it when I get to teaching people about how you go about dealing with a challenge like cuculeo. But the clay gave us a tool that helped repel them and push and pull them to untreated trees where you can put chickens underneath. That's one of the options to help capture a lot of that population. Fungal diseases. Well, that, that kind of opens up an interesting story. I was, I went to college and got a degree in civil engineering. I grew up in the suburbs. My grandparents were farmers. Um, my grandfather had a market garden in Pennsylvania, and, and my other grandfather had a potato farm just over the hill from where the Rodale Research Farm is located in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And so I was quite removed from the idea that someday I'm going to get my hands in the earth and make part of my living. By working with plants. And so I approached it wanting to be organic. I was reading the Rodale literature at the time. I started to meet a few other growers and we heard how difficult it was. And the talk was you needed to spray sulfur 20, 30 times a season to deal with things like apple scab, which is a fungal disease. And while it was fine, I was learning, um, wasn't super succeeding, and started to meet some more growers. But the key pivotal moment occurred, and that's when my wife, Nancy, decided to become an herbalist. So this is the story. Often, it's the lady who studies plant medicine. Meanwhile, back on the home front, there is what I call the, her the herbal husband. And the herbal husband is, is, a, is a decent guy, and he goes about his life thinking he's doing okay. But meanwhile, when the lady comes home with all this knowledge about healing plants, and wants to try tinctures and salves and all these different remedies, she turns to her herbal husband, and he's suddenly given remedies for all sorts of conditions he had no idea he even had. <laughs> <laughs> but what comes out of that is this insight into seeing how the way to build health is to support the system, the body system's immune function. And I took that insight and applied it to farming, to, to gardening, how I grow plants. And that's what opened the whole world of what I call holistic orcharding. And, you know, today I don't spray sulfur at all for fungal diseases. I, there's a, just a whole other approach that I've undertaken based on the fact that I recognize how nature herself does health, how trees and the soil food web are meant to work in conjunction 
to do health. And that in turn results in, in healthier apples for us. So let's dive in and talk about that, because I feel like that's really the heart of your book. The Mycorrhizal Planet is about encouraging this environment and encouraging the plant health and and the surrounding what's the right term uh, fungal sphere in, in a way. I know that's not the right term, but in a way that does fight off disease uh, and helps to helps your plants resist the pests. One of the first questions I asked myself was, where does a tree really want to grow? I'm talking about a perennial woodsy tree. And that answer keys to where the fungal biomass in the soil is 10 times greater than the bacterial biomass. And all that kind of information comes out of Elaine Ingham and the soil food web and understanding all these microorganisms and how they work together to create minerals that plants take up and, and so forth. But as I, I started to learn about the fungal realm, that, that notion of fungal biomass greater than bacterial biomass points directly to the edge of the forest. And so when I talk about where do fruit trees want to grow, I am looking to bring that forest edge soil ecology underneath my fruit trees. It isn't like I'm literally planting trees or berries on the edge of the forest, but I want to bring that soil ecology, that type of life to the ground beneath my trees. And that's where I coined the term fungal duff management. And now I'm talking about what are the right kind of fungal foods to encourage both the saprotrophic fungi, those are the decomposers of organic matter, and the mycorrhizal fungi, which form this symbiotic relationship with the roots of not just apple trees, but in truth, 95% of the plants on this planet. And, and we're going to want to come back to that. Anyway, fungal dust management starts with creating fungal conditions. And what I like to tell people is just take your mind's eye to the edge of the forest. What's happening there? Raspberry canes are falling over. Goldenrod is falling over. Succession species of trees are selecting, and some of them are falling over. All that cellulose and lignin material is being broken down by the fungi to increase the humus. And what that means from a practical point of view is to bring that kind of organic matter underneath your fruit trees. So one of, one of the things I love to use and I teach about is the, the concept of Romeo chip wood. Researchers at Laval University in Quebec back in the 70s and 80s started this. And they were looking at what can we do with the tops of hardwood trees left from logging operations for agricultural purpose. But what they were doing, in truth, was tapping into the fertility basis of eastern soils, because our soils are forest-derived. And what they learned was that the tops of trees, smaller portion, two and a half inches in diameter or less, is going to be that much more rich in mineral nutrition stored in the green cambium bark that is in all those twigs and all those tiny buds. And when that mineral organic matter is returned to the soil, it's broken down by what are known as the white rot. And the white rot are the fungi that are really adept at creating humic substances. And there's a lot more to learn about Romeo Chip Wood. And, and there's a paper on my website uh, at groworganicapples.com. There's a, one of the buttons is biological curriculum, and, and people can get a lot of information there. But the point here is that I am creating the very kind of soil that a tree wants to grow in. And I'm utilizing brush from clearing along fence lines and under power lines, I'm even utilizing the prunings from my orchard because that is hardwood and it's small in diameter. It's mostly bud and twig wood. The whole goal here is, is just to get that fungal thing happening. And when there's lots of humic substances and happy decomposition fungi, you're also going to have happy mycorrhizal fungi. And here's where things really turn towards the cool side. Mycorrhizal fungi are of basically two types. There's ecto, E-C-T-O, mycorrhizae, that have a relationship with the trees of the forest, both hardwood and conifers. And then there are endomycorrhizae that have a relationship with fruit trees and berries and potatoes and winter squash and onions 
and the list goes on and on. And this is where we, we start to touch on the concept of what I call fungal gardening or fungal farming as well. Um, endomycorrhizae, E-N-D-O, actually penetrate into the cells of the root. And they do this in order to exchange mineral nutrition and nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus and potassium and, and all that for carbon sugars because fungi can't synthesize carbon, but plants can through photosynthesis. So plants and fungi evolved with this mutual relationship of providing for each other. What happens when mycorrhizal fungi penetrate the, the cells of the root of the plant, the plant in turn responds with an immune response, not directed at the mycorrhizal fungi, but which stimulates the stems and the leaves and the buds and the fruits of the plant to be on a higher alert in terms of potential pests and pathogens and herbivores. This is where phytochemicals come into being that make the plant taste a little more bitter, phytochemicals that volatize and attract beneficial insects to the plant to protect it. And, and it's the fungi that are one of the initiators of what is known as induced systemic resistance. Now, I build on that principle with my holistic sprays. But the way all these things tie together is just so magnificent and beautiful. And, and we have been missing that boat for decades and decades. And it is really neat that now we have both the microscopic insights and also a much finer tuned awareness of how plant physiology work in terms of standing up to disease and pest pressures. And then there's one more little bit, and that's the bonus for us. When apples or whatever produce you want to talk about are grown in a living soil system and all this is taking place, and by that, I also mean a touch of environmental reality. There are some insects chewing on the arugula. There is some scab spotting on the apple. All of that means that those plants that are growing the food that we eat are going through those phytochemical processes to deal with that reality. And those phytochemicals, in turn, are what we as a species grew up with when we were out there eating the nuts and the wild apples and the occasional mastodon, whatever the hunter-gathering society would find, we grew up with food that was laced with all this goodness in terms of helping our bodies ward off degenerative disease. And that full circle, having real food grown on farms, really emphasizing soil health, is where our health comes from. It's really interesting to me what you just said, that it's the mycorrhizal fungi that are getting into the roots of the plants. And that's actually causing an immune response in the plants. Although I, is immune response the right word to use there? Immune response is fine. I call it green immune function because it's, it, it's not like our immune system with red blood cells and leukocytes, but it's a phytochemical process. And, and we can think of it in terms of immunity the way our bodies work in that there's an immediate response to pests and disease, but there's also this adaptive immune response. And mycorrhizal fungi, the endomycorrhizae in particular, the ones that penetrate into the cell, stimulate that response. But they don't stimulate it against themselves. They stimulate it against other things. How does that work? So some disease organisms, fungal in nature, when they penetrate the cell of the plant, there's a direct immune cascade that takes place phytochemically to try to resist that. Mycorrhizae have made a deal with plants because they evolved together. And in that kind of co-evolutionary pact, um, the plant doesn't try to shut down the fungal presence of mycorrhizae, but in turn, it's stimulated to produce the compounds that go throughout the sap and into the produce and into the leaf to prepare the plant for whatever comes. And you know as a grower yourself that many things can come. Now, we can enhance that induced systemic resistance that the mycorrhizal fungi kick off, and that's where we just get into plants that are healthier and healthier. And this is what I do when I talk about holistic sprays. And it's, it's primarily about 
kicking in that phytochemical response and also creating a competitive microbe environment on the surface of plants. And when you talk about those mycorrhizal fungi actually penetrating into the roots of the plant, are they, are they moving through the intercellular spaces? Are they going through the, the xylem and the phloem where the water's getting moved? Or are they actually going into the cells themselves? This is where we need a nice picture, Chris. <laughs> um, they penetrate through the epidermis cells into the next couple rows of, of cells in the root cortex. They're not actually going into the, the center where the xylem and, and the fluid flow is. So they're, they're both going between the cells, and then they form these little tree-like structures. I mean, and in truth, when you look at a picture at an arbuscule, which is the nutrient transfer mechanism of a mycorrhizal fungi, it looks like a tree, or it looks like the feet or root system of a plant. Or if you are kind of have a medical viewpoint, you would see the alveoli of our own lungs. I, I like to say... In herbalism, there's something called doctrine of signatures. And when, when you recognize something in a plant, the way that it grows, the way that it, it forms, it gives you a hint as to the medicine. When you look at endomycorrhizae inside the root cell itself, you see a tree, you see life, and, and you realize there is this incredible connection to life between these soil fungi and the plants that give us oxygen, that photosynthesize that sunshine to produce carbon sugars. And this whole underground economy is what makes the lives of you and I possible. And it's, it's, it's now you've got me up on my pedestal, but it's such an amazing gift that this fungal membrane throughout the soils of the earth and even in the ocean floor itself, um, which is getting into a slightly different type of fungal realm, um, this is what holds life sacred trust. This is what keeps it together for us. And once you recognize that, the way to farm, the way to garden, the way to orchard, the way to respect the living forest, all becomes so clear to me. And, and that's a big part of what I'm hoping this book is going to do. Because we've all heard great teachers, many different books, many different lectures, many different podcast, um, and the message is often the same, but it's, it's not quite as defined as, my God, we got to honor these fungi. we got to learn how to do growing without disturbing the soil. And once we get that part and we really get fired up about it, you know, that's, that's we're now coming into the, the big talk, the talk about what's going to happen to our planet, given the current course that it's on. And mycorrhizal fungi go beyond this immune function stimulation to curing lamellin, which is a protein substance where 30% of the carbon in the soil gets locked in place. And mycorrhizal fungi have a big role in forming soil aggregates, which, again, is where organic matter is stored for the long term, where carbon is, is put back in that soil. And the more we all get going as a culture, as a society, as individuals, to work to regenerate the land, to heal the land, and, and do that because we understand that the fungi matter, we have a chance. And that in itself is, is exciting. And I always get charged up when I, when I hear this. But one of the things I run into is, you know, as a vegetable farmer, I tilled, right? We till. This is what we do. We, we need bare soil uh, to succeed. We need disturbance to succeed. And how, how do you run a functional vegetable operation while still respecting and honoring the, the role of the mycorrhizae? Growers have been learning a lot about non-tillage techniques or in truth, organic growers reduce tillage techniques. So the work of Jeff Moyer at, at the Rodale Institute has introduced the, the notion of growing rye and vetch and how you can crimp those crops and then plant into it. And, and that works for certain crops. And then, then you have work of people like Jean-Martin Fortier up in Quebec. He's using um, tarps that can breathe, can let air and moisture pass through to burn up the weed seed and then plant. Um, there are 
power implement for something like the BCS tractor that, well, one is, is the flail mower, so you can cut and chop up a cover crop without disturbing the root system. And then there's this power harrow, which rather than vertically tills, horizontally stirs. And so the more you can limit your cover crop planting to an inch or two of disturbance at most, you're launching, you're, you're, you're holding your own. So I realize there are fine seeded things that you need to get into the ground. So these are tools that you can limit how far down the disturbance goes. But then we also get into the, I, the notions of, of more diversity in the market garden, having what I would call mycorrhizal refuges. And, and that might be raspberry planting. That might be asparagus beds. that perennial crops where you're definitely not needing to disturb the soil, but they're next to where you're growing annual crops. And so the mycorrhizae have a, a springboard, so to speak. I, I write about a lot of this from the home garden and market garden perspective and, and get into some of the, the gist of, of how I myself and others are going about minimizing disturbance in the soil. Then you have the work of, of Gabe Brown and working with cover crop cocktails and there are ways, and, and we're kind of ruffians, so to speak, in, in learning how to discern how we can do better. But, but that's really what I want to fire up in people. We can do better. There are people already achieving this reduced till agriculture. So that's also important to say. You know, if, if you get it down to maybe you till only every two or three years and you u- utilize concepts like biological tillage, that's using cover crops that winter kill, things like tillage radish that fills down deep and with oats that winter kill, leaving you a mulch to plant in in the spring as far as transplanting goes. Um, use decomposition tillage, the, the Romeo wood chip idea on perennial beds, breaking down over time. Um, there's many ways to go about it, and hopefully I'm going to inspire a more fungal conversation around that with mycorrhizal planets. So let's back up just a little bit here. If I've got a field full of vegetables and so I've got, you know, I've got, I've got some carrots, I've got tomatoes, I've got peas and green beans, and they're all out there in the soil. And then what does, what, what does the mycorrhizal population look like underneath there? All that stuff that we can't see are, are they, tell me how that's structured actually in the soil. Mycorrhizal networks form, and as I said earlier, 95% of plants have this. So things like broccoli, anything in the coal family, does not. Things like red beet, Swiss chard, do not. But most vegetables do. Most cover crops do. Something like buckwheat does not have a mycorrhizal affiliation. And we think of it initially in terms of one plant gets colonized by a fungus, there's penetration into root cells. In truth, any one plant can be colonized by 20 different species of fungi at the same time. And that's what starts to connect plants of one type to plants of other types. And this network builds that passes nutrients from one end of the field to the other according to where the need is greatest. And, and plants announce that need by saying, I have some good carbon sugar to trade. You want to do a deal, man? Um, and that, that trade is just mind-blowing when you get into the, the, the nuance of, of minerals getting to where they need to go. The fungal network also helps plants in drought situations. The fungi are invested in keeping photosynthesis functioning because that's where they get carbon from. So water is distributed through a mycorrhizal network. Communication is facilitated through this fungal network in terms of telling that row of beans, cucumber beetles down on this end, let's get prepared. Um, So many fascinating connections are taking place. As growers, we have our assortment of crops. They come into harvest at different points in the season. Ideally, we try to manage the ground so at any given time, there really isn't bare ground. And I don't mean that radically, like there's never a fallow period, but those fallow periods are seriously limited 
and over the winter there is a cover crop in place and that is carrying forward the fungal connection and the fungi carry forward in both root fragments and as spores but the real neat thing is is once you start to understand that at any, any given site 20 to 50 species of fungi and then when we get into the forest this goes up to a couple hundred species of fungi um, are forming this interconnected web to which nutrition and chemical signaling, warnings, and water are passing to where it needs to go. So more we can maintain that, and, and the simplest way to think about that is no bare ground. Um, the more we can maintain that, the more it carries forward to the next crop and the next crop. And I can't emphasize enough how important healthy plants are when we're talking about some kind of fungal disease coming on the scene in a big way. So in the orchard, I might talk about apple scab or cedar apple rust or powdery mildew. In, in the vegetable garden, um, something like late blight is a fungal pathogen. It was about, I don't know, eight years ago or so that all these plants in the big box stores were produced down somewhere in, I believe, South Carolina. And that supplier passed along plants that carried late blight fungal spores, which in turn infected home gardens, which in turn spread in the air and affected market gardens throughout New England and, and the Northeast. And late blight is, is the cause of the Irish potato famine. And it was interesting to, to hear the advice coming from the advisors, <laughs> the extension people. Uh, organic growers, you really had only one choice, and that was to spray copper. And then next week, get out and spray copper again. And if the next week, if your plants still weren't dead, maybe try copper one more time, but then just pull up the plants because you, you needed to interrupt this cycle. Well, that's the way we think when we are in that mode of pathogen, find a toxin to take care of the symptom, which is the, the disease, which is so different than what nature wants to do, both through the mycorrhizal networking and through plant immune function. And when I spray the orchard with the holistic sprays, which includes things like liquid fish and seaweed and pure neem oil and effective microbes, and, and we can get into that a little more if you want to, I am putting fatty acids out there and competitive microbes on the surface of my potatoes and tomatoes at the same time I spray my orchard. And I am boosting the immune function of my potatoes and my tomatoes. And that, in turn, prepares the plant for when that late flight spore comes, it's a much different story. And mycorrhizae I tie into this as well. But as you start to see how all these things come together, it's, it's just so exciting. It's like, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm still in my 50s, Chris. In truth, I have about four months to go on that <laughs> score. But how great it would be to be a young farmer again as we're just starting to discover things that are going to make us so much better at, at growing food for ourselves and, and being healthy overall. I think one of the challenges to the approach you're talking about, I mean, just to take that example of late blight is that, you know, if, if you find out that, that there's a disease outbreak heading your way, you already better have some of that stuff in place. I mean, this really is a long-term strategy, right? Building up the mycorrhizae in the soil, building up the health of your plants. It's not like the day that you see a disease on a neighboring farm, you can say, oh, I'm going to change what I'm doing now. It's something that you really have to play for the long haul. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. No, it's very preemptive. I mean, when you're taking this holistic approach, those connections are, are not bought in the local store and inserted the next day. It's, this is something you build. And the fungal networks are something that we do wise farming, through cover cropping, through that principle of no bare ground, through inoculating certain crops, through inoculating um, not just the vegetables, sometimes the cover crops, depending on the cycle of our tillage. You know, when do we really need to recover this? Maybe we well, I use the term biological compromise. You know, sometimes you, you face this decision, I need to till. I need, for this particular disease event, the way it played out, 
I'm going to use sulfur again just once as an allopathic touch to get through this time. Um, and, and every one of those stories has a lot more nuance to it. But there will be times when we need to recover where we were. But ideally, as we learn to work things, concepts like biological tillage, um, winter-killed cover crops, um, occultation, um, that power harrow is, is an incredible tool once you, you see it in operation and how little it disturbs the soil. Um, there are ways that we can make this work. There are ways that we can do fungal things better and better. And you're right. That means that when the disease spore lands from the sky and selects, you are the one who's going to get this now. Um, we are more prepared than not. The plants, the soil are ready to do environmental reality as only they know how to do. I oftentimes say about whether it's learning how to manage employees or, or have better relationships with people or even to get on top of your farm finances. When I'm teaching classes, I, I talk about when's the best time to learn Taekwondo, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's before three guys jump you in a dark alley. You know, and so I guess this, I mean, that's really what you're saying here is that you, you need to be, you have to be ahead of the curve on this, that you, you need to, you need to be building up your soils, the mycorrhizal networks, the mycorrhizal population in general, um, the health of your plants that results from that before your plants get jumped by three guys in a dark alley. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can see health. You can see the vibrancy in green leaves, and, and any grower knows when that vibrancy is there, pest pressures tend to be more, I don't want to say under control, but more nudgeable. They're not overwhelming. Similarly, there's growers who go out and read the bricks of plants and, and check the plant sap to see if those soluble sugars, if complete proteins are in place, because there are many insects that can't digest complete proteins. Um, similarly, fungal pathogens, when they tap into the cell, the sap of a plant, they are looking primarily to absorb soluble amino acids. And if in turn, we have really ramped healthy plant metabolism into gear through both fungal networking and, and holistic methods, we're going to see plants able to, to stand up to that pressure. And it's going to make it possible to have a whole lot less need for intervention to make up for the fact that pathogens are here. There, there's a new pest um, throughout this country as of six, eight years ago called spotted wing Drosophila. Spotted wing Drosophila is the Japanese vinegar fly. It's a fruit fly, but unlike the native North American fruit flies, it reproduces every eight days and it starts in unripe fruit and fruit can mean the tomato, it can mean the cherry, it can mean the blueberry, it can mean the fall raspberry. And this is a very aggressive pest. But on the other hand, when we're working with healthy plant metabolism, which mycorrhizal fungi play a role in, that means that plants in turn don't have the same seed attractant to boost those populations. And so, a nudging spray of something like spinosad, which I don't go too quickly, but I will utilize, um, can knock those numbers back in check if they start to get out of hand. Whereas if you're looking at not just three guys in an alley, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fruit flies, you're facing a scenario that's almost impossible to get an upper hand on. Michael, I'm, I'm a little bit of a control freak. I, I like to, I like, and, and and we'll say I try to temper that, but you know, I want to be in control. I want to, I want to, when I see a problem, I want to respond to it. Um, it seems to me that it must take a lot of faith not to panic when you're relying on these more holistic systems of plant health rather than relying on a, a pest and response situation or pest and response strategy. I'll probably be answering that question mostly in an orchard context, but no, certainly you do respond. Certainly common sense horticulture still rules. I mean, you have a tomato patch and late light strikes on one end. You don't 
wait a few days to see if the fungi will come to the rescue. But plants that are more than 20% infected, you pull them so that they're not a source of pathogens to keep spreading down the line. Because um, things happen. It's, it's even for us as a, a family eating a lot of our own food that we grow, the, the free range chickens and, and all that, uh, eating my holistic apples. It doesn't mean something won't happen, you know. I have a nice sidebar in the book about how we do what we think is right. We, 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 we stand by our principles. And yet, it isn't about being pure. It's about recognizing you do the best you can. And maybe every morning you do yoga and you drink metal tea. That's great. But still, things can happen. And something can happen to any one of us. And that doesn't mean we suddenly go to the far side of the extreme and necessarily choose radiation or, or chemotherapy. Some people, that might be the right choice for them because your beliefs tie in here as well. But it means that we still do what we think is the best thing to do. But we, we do take steps. We're, we've been affected. Our plants have been affected. There's things we need to go and, and consider. But to consider that in a context of, is this an allopathic choice? by which I mean a toxin for the symptom, or is this something that builds system health? And once you get things going, you've gone through that biological transition, you get those fungi back in your soil. Um, once you get arboreal biology on your side, and that's where effective microbes and compost teas come in. Once you get balanced mineral nutrition, which the fungi play a fantastic role, and making happen. Once those things are in place, that's what you still support. Even when you realize, okay, uh, let's take fire blight. Um, fire blight is this bacterial disease that gets into the blossom of an apple or a pear tree, wherever there's an opportunity. The wind whip shoot, driven by hard rains, they tear, aphids chew. All of those are opportunities for bacteria to get into. In Integrated pest management orchards, what we call conventional orchards, they use synthetic antibiotics to deal with that. I, on the other hand, and I can't see any of this, know that if the conditions are right, it's going to be in the 80s. There's a moisture in the air. Those are the right conditions for bacteria to spread quickly and find those opportunities. When I go out and make a holistic spray during bloom, the recipe changes a little bit, but it, it's primarily microbes. And whether those are yeast or bacteria, they colonize the surface of the plant, which in turn means one of three things is going to happen for that blight bacteria landing in the flower. One, the blight bacterium itself gets consumed because microbe eating microbe is what microbes do. <laughs> That's the whole soil food web. At its, it's working its magic. In this case, now it's up in the air. It's on the surface of the plant. That's why I use the word arboreal food web. Secondly, there may not be the food resources needed by that bacterium to launch itself into the vascular system of the plant because the other microbes are consuming it. Or, and this is beauty, those other microbes, the bacteria in particular, are producing antibiotic compounds right there at the source of the challenge and dealing with the bacteria. And different researchers have shown that microbes can outcompete bacteria. There's, there's spray products. Now you could buy blight ban, which is a pseudomonas bacterium, or you could buy blossom protect, which is two strains of yeast to do this colonization. Others will use compost tea, but it, it's still about timing. It's about knowing that this is an opportunistic organism and rather than reaching for the approved synthetic antibiotic medicine, which we can't use in certified organics anymore anyway, you go to the microbes. You realize how the source works. And, and I think, and hopefully that example is helping you and, and your listeners to see this, we're supplementing, working with the way nature does it. And it works. And, and our notion of medicines and coming in with those toxins um, whether they're natural substances and approved by OMRI and organic or not. You know, that's the last choice. But it isn't necessarily wrong that we eventually are forced to that or in a transition situation, we ponder that 
scenario more often. But it, it's a choice. And once we start making these healthy choices and we build it and we see how it comes together, that magic, that, that, that greenness, that energy, um, it works. And as we learn to just see our role as a steward of this incredible team of microorganisms and, and, and get these networking communities of fungi, not disturb them, not break them up, but do as much as we can to usher them into the next planting, to usher them into the next growing season, we just see less and less of the problem. I mean, that's what I've seen in my orchard, and it's, it's the message that I just really have to emphasize to every grower out there. This works. Do fungal things. This works. Awesome. With that, Michael, we're going to take a break and get a word from our sponsors. And when we come back, I want to talk about how to do fungal things. Okay. Right. Sounds good. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Farm Commons. You know, I had a great attorney while I was farming, but in a town surrounded by a sea of corn and soybeans, he often didn't understand the ins and outs of what we were up to on a legal front. Whether it was dealing with intern housing, in-kind wages, land leases for my market farm, or putting my CSA on a strong legal footing. But Farm Commons gets it. And what's more, Farm Commons turns that understanding into practical, accessible, and easy to understand resources to put the law into plain language without oversimplifying things. And did I say they were free? Free. Even my great attorney didn't do that. With an ever-growing selection of free guides, model documents, and video tutorials, Farm Commons understands that a strong, resilient farm business is built on a solid legal foundation. Visit the Farm Commons website or watch for their interactive workshops held around the country. Farmcommons.org. And by Small Farm Central, providers of Member Assembler CSA management software. Member Assembler makes it easy for CSA members to sign up and for you to manage the process, all in a flexible, easy to customize format. And once you have your members signed up, Member Assembler gives you better ways to get your CSA information to your staff, including customizable pickup lists, box building tools, and calculated harvest lists. It makes it easy for CSA members to update their shares and request vacation holds, and it provides a platform for segmented and scheduled email messaging. Plus, Member Assembler's auto rollover tool has been shown to increase lifetime retention by 6 to 7% all on its own, a feature that can be worth hundreds of dollars per member in lifetime value. Member Assembler helps you spend less time in the office and more time doing what you do best. Farming. Smallfarmcentral.com. And we're back with Michael Phillips from Lost Nation Orchard in the extreme northern New Hampshire, and he's also the author of Mycorrhizal Planet. So, Michael, it's my understanding when you've got a when you've got a field full of of crops, right, that underneath the soil, there's a you've developed kind of a what I think of as like a mycelial web. It's like this, you know, you've got you've got these hyphae, these these sort of root like structures from the from the fungi running every which way in the soil. Is that a is that a fair thing to say? Yes. So fungi, their hyphae can anastomize, which means they can actually fuse into the same species of fungi to form like a new highway, a new, a new route to go. And, and that's what builds the network. And the different fungal networks based on fungal species come together in the roots of plants. And that's where cooperatives in a, in a sort are formed in terms of trading nutrients. And one fungal system delivers to another fungal system through the plant sap. And this whole fungal networking takes place in the top inches of soil in the humus layer. And in those top four inches, it's far more dense than it is in the next four inches below and so forth. However, that fungal network can extend to three to four feet deep or even deeper in the case of, of forest mycorrhizae. There are different types. Um, but knowing that, but the greatest density is higher up is where we get into one of the principles behind what we know as gentle tillage. And by not flipping four, six, eight inches of soil to achieve a more amenable surface, but rather flipping one to two inches to the extent that we can, or, or flipping it in the context of a incorporating a cover crop or a rough compost, all of that keeps those tines from going deeper and deeper and chopping up more and more of the fungi. And it's, it's that vertical tillage and plowing where we break those fungal ne 
networks. And, and the more efficient the tiller, the more you shatter it into bits and go back to square one. So there'll be some recovery from the fungi themselves. We can choose plants and manage these hyphal networks so that they are ongoing. Um, one key point here to understand is, is mycorrhizae form a relationship with plant roots. When I talk about no bare ground, it's because there's no plant roots there then. And there's no top of the plant to photosynthesize and put carbon in the soil. It's, it's that bringing together of fungi and root that creates possibility of a mycorrhizal network. Now, because we have, I mean, periodically in market farming, we do create a bare soil situation. If we're leaving a, a space without mycorrhizae, there's still other funguses that are surviving in there. How long do the mycorrhizae actually hang on? I mean, how quickly is it necessary to get something established before we lose the network of mycorrhizae that was there? So mycorrhizae fungi carry forward in, in three ways. One is through existing networks expanding. So that's what we see during the growing season. That, that's why when I talked about mycorrhizal refuges, um, there's an existing network that spreads the typhi outboard. And if other plants are close enough or are replaced, replenished soon enough, then there's that connection. How close is close enough? Mycorrhizae, depending on the species, the type, some, it's a fraction of an inch. Others, we start to get into a longer reach. And one, one way of understanding what's called the mycorrhizosphere is it's basically three times more reaching than the rhizosphere, the root zone itself, the roots that we can see. And that doesn't sound like much. But again, it, it's through this fusion of hyphae to the next plant over and the next plant over. And when you introduce diversity, and there are perennial plants, and some of those species have ecto-mycorrhizal affiliation, those are the ones that have longer runner hyphae. And that's why, again, it's, it, it's not just a question of a monocrop. It's a question of diversity and lots of different plants, because that means lots of different fungal species having an opportunity to come together in, in what I call passage plants to build that network further and further out. So back to the propagation aspect, mycorrhizae fungi will carry over for six months in root fragments. Now that's an important concept because we all know there's a dormant season, a fallow season. You can grow a cover crop. Winter rye is going to overwinter, oats are not. But in those crops where mycorrhizae had enough time to develop or mass and vesicles, which is a lipid storage structure of the fungi in the root cell. Um, when there's enough time for that to take place, and, and that's on the order of three to four months, then you have something that's going to carry over for six months to the next growing cycle when plants are going to be put back in there. So there, there's actually some leeway here. It's just that when we chop it up, we always go back to square one. And, and when gardeners pull those plants out by the roots, they're removing the ability of that fungi to carry forward in root fragments because they've been pulled. And then the final way is through the production of spores. Now, all of us who are mushroom hunters know we look for the fruiting bodies in, in the woods of chanterelles and bolites and morels and, and all these different types of visible mycorrhizal fungi. The, in the forest, the ectomycorrhizae form mushrooms to sporulate, but endomycorrhizae do it in the soil either in the mycorrhizosphere right around the root or in some cases within the root itself. And those spores hold a viability of one, two, perhaps three, four years. Again, it's a question of having enough spore density, so to speak, in a given field so that plants that are planted inches away, and I know this sounds really small, but nature has this covered if, if we're doing it right mere inches away to get that connection and start it all over again. Now, we can facilitate that as well. We can um, take, for instance, a raised bed planting where you get alliums in more or less along the edges, and then you're putting tomatoes down the heart of it. And that, that's not for every market garden design, but what you're doing is you're, you're allowing two, three months of mycorrhizal establishment on alliums so then it's right there next to the tomatoes when that time comes. 
and those connections get made to carry forward to really launch the tomato ecosystem. Similarly, you know, just inoculating potting soil um, with spore, with these, with these different mycorrhizal inoculum products available from companies like MycoApply and BioOrganics. That's a great way to get a fungal networking going in your, your small potting space and your soil blocks. It, it takes two, three weeks to establish. Once established, you have plants that are more resistant to damping off disease because you have competitive organisms in there protecting those roots. You have plants that are going to experience far less transplant shock because they have this network to help them take hold, to get rooted in there. So there's many ways to, to preserve that mycorrhizal connection, and, and that is the goal. So when you talk about inoculating your potting soil with, with mycorrhizae, is that necessary if you're using a compost-based potting soil? The answer is yes. And again, we have to go back to that fundamental definition of what is a mycorrhiza. So mica means mycology, the fungal realm, coming together with the rhiza, the root of a plant. And it, it's, the, it's that union of fungi and plant root that is a mycorrhiza. And mycorrhizae are in soils where living plants are. Compost, we've taken organic matter and people have done a great job in terms of thinking about bacterial fungal balance, not overheating the pile, adding the right kinds of organic matter. I know one of the things I love about Vermont compost, which is one of the, the products I use here, I'm oh, approximately about two hours away from where this is made. Um, they put yellow birch bark and, and other Romeo chipped wood materials into their compost, which is going to create that dynamic for the, the white rots I've talked about, the, the sapotrophic fungi, the decomposition fungi, and it, it just creates far more diversity. But even the very best compost does not come with mycorrhizae because we're not growing plants in there. There are no roots in order to create spores in compost. And that's the reason for inoculating seedling. Does having an existing hyphal network or an existing, uh, the existence of saprophytic fungi in a, in a compost, in a potting soil or in the soil, does, does that help the mycorrhizae to get established if you're using an inoculum or an inoculant? I would think so. I, I guess I have to take the other extreme here and that would be hydroponics and, and growing marijuana. And those other species are not there and yet mycorrhizae benefit those plants. Now, you and I probably share an opinion about hydroponics is, is not quite as good as the living earth, as real soil. Um, and that's where you tie into these sapotrophic fungi and you tap into all sorts of bacteria. And there are da dynamics, there's interchange between rhizobacteria and mycorrhizae. And it's a, a much more complex picture and we humans who tend to want to separate and compartmentalize uh, would assume. But yes, again, it's, it's the more diversity of life, the more nutrient dense the foods that we grow are going to be. So if I'm going to use a mycorrhizal inoculant in, say, my, in my transplant production, because that seems like a logical place where I would, I would want to do that with my onions or my tomatoes. Uh, so I'm in, the, I'm in the greenhouse. Is it something that I'm I'm blending into my potting soil, or is it something that I want to sprinkle on top? What are some ways to get the most out of doing that? I do a lot of, of my plants with soil blocks. So when I start the tiny seedlings in a, a seedling tray, um, well, in truth, I actually inoculate that soil too. It, it doesn't hurt to, to launch the connection as soon as you can. But I just have a bin of soil where I'm going to take the soil blocker and I do a dusting and then I stir it in so that the spores are ideally uniformly spread throughout and those soil blocks are made and, and that connection is now made for the tomato plant that goes in there. That connection is made for the four onion seeds that sprout in the soil block and become four plants together when you plant them out in the garden, if, that, if that's your method. Yeah, it's as simple as that. You know, in truth, if, if you're going to have a day where it's, all broccoli and kale and cauliflower and cabbage plants that you're doing, don't waste your money on inoculum. Those plants do not make that connection. 
And and that's that's just simply a fact that through coevolution, through extreme habitat, and maybe because George Bush didn't like broccoli. I don't I don't know why, but they lost this affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. On the other hand, nature is so adaptable and sometimes it comes back. But that mere act of taking a quality inoculum, you know, one of the my favorite potting soil is Fort V, again, from Vermont Compost. Um, it's such a simple step to do, and then you've launched it. And those spores awaken. It's going to take two to three weeks. But in the process of growing out that tomato plant, let's say, and, and you pot it up, well, that carries along with the root system of that little tomato and then extends out into the soil. But the soil that you pot up with, you might inoculate, but it's... If you did it right from the beginning, it's already there with the root system. Similarly, when I plant a bare root fruit tree, I know that most rootstock comes from a place that is not very fungal. The big rootstock farms fumigate the soil, and it's, it's just not managed that way. And an organic nursery would certainly introduce mycorrhizal connections, but for the most part, fruit tree roots don't come with the inoculum. Bioorganics makes this root dip, and I dip that bare root system every time I see that gel and crystallizing on the surface of the roots, and when I plant that tree and spread the roots for the duration of its life in this earth, I know that I have launched it with the right kind of connection. This whole fungal thing is, is, is a lot like making sourdough bread. If you're a baker, you've got the concept down that you keep a little bit of the dough for the next batch, because that will inoculate the next batch with the yeast. Similarly, you just need to get a little bit of inoculum to launch an incredibly beautiful realm of fungi. One of the things that growers can do as well is you can actually make your own inoculum. Um, Rodale did some research on this. This was the work of, of David Dowd. And what he did was Use plants like annual ryegrass or Baha'i grass, grew them out in sacks over the course of the summer with indigenous fungi taken from a healthy wild ecosystem. And over the course of three to four months, many species sporulate. So by the time the grasses die back in the fall, the soil itself and all the root fragments in those sacks is displaced with spores. And that inoculum is what you can mix into your potting soil. So it's, there's many ways you can go about this. It's, it's just understanding it's really, really important. And especially when we are recovering from a disturbance situation, be that tillage, be that years and years of herbicide on a conventional cornfield that the young idealistic organic farmer is now going to convert, um, be that the suburban house lot where the bulldozer has scraped the topsoil, um, be that where you grew broccoli all summer long, or you went in with a buckwheat cover crop but not a diversity of cover crop plants. There are situations that call for remedial action and bringing back the inoculum. And in those situations, so, I mean, a lot of market farms are very heavy on the brassicas, and buckwheat's a great way to do a catch crop of for, for getting something in that can grow fast and, and really does a nice job with, with uh, loosening up the soil. When you talk about reestablishing the the mycorrhizal networks in those soils, how much stuff are we talking about putting on? I mean, if I've got if I've got a sack full of soil where I've I've made my own inoculum, are you spreading that out on that field, or are you just thinking that maybe if you stir that up with the seeds that you're putting in your seed drill, that's gonna that's gonna be enough there? I mean, what I mean, how are we talking about getting this reestablishing uh, where we've where we've taken it away? So one, we haven't so much taken it away as we haven't supported it for an interim period. So there is very likely to be spores of some species that are still in that ground unless it's a heavily disturbed, abused soil situation. But nearly growing broccoli, cauliflower, what have you, and even on bigger and bigger plots, doesn't necessarily remove it all, but it, it, it lessens the spore density and the carryover may be harder to find that connection, come back as quickly. And what you just mentioned about the seed drill is an excellent way to inoculate cover crop seeds. And, and I'm still going to use a buckwheat cover, particularly when I prepare my garlic ground from whatever I harvested in midsummer, because um, buckwheat just fits that window so nicely. Ideally, 
I might grow some other cover plants. There are people who put oats in that planting um, and then plant the garlic into the remaining oats, the buckwheat. Winter kills can be mowed down, but the oats will grow back. But that affiliation carries forward fungal connections in the garlic bed, and then the winter kills the oats, leaving you with a nicely mulched bed. So different plants have different natures that we can work with to do this. But inoculating a cover crop cocktail in a very heavily abused situation gets you back up on your feet, um, whether you've grown broccoli or cauliflower or cabbage or, or red beets or Swiss chard. And, and also just the neighborliness of if that planting is, let's say, a 10-foot swath and there's other plants that have mycorrhizal affiliation nearby and then you plant a cover crop because it's winter and that reaches back into the cover crop, you're not necessarily buying inoculum at every turn. But there's a few basics to understand here that it takes three to four months for a cover crop to get to the spore stage. Root fragments hold that viability for six months. Once you start to see those pieces and the plants that you're working with, you can recognize, okay, if I do it in this order, and it's not a monoculture of 40 acres of broccoli, I can keep this connection going. You talked about getting your inoculum from the wild. You said that, you know, in Rodale did these experiments growing the, growing the annual ryegrass to create a uh, mycorrhizal rich soil that that was, that was done in bags filled with soil from nearby forests. Is, is that something that is, is there additional value in using my native mycorrhizae as opposed to buying something in a bag? The SAC idea is really useful to market gardeners who want to have root fragments in their inoculum. And when you buy a product, the root fragment portion probably has spent its six months waiting for you to be ready to use that product. But when you have that SAC filled with spores and root fragments, that launches seedlings sooner because out of root fragments, that connection can be made in as little as a week. But there's some relevance there, particularly for plants that maybe have damping off problems. On the other hand, um, when you go out to a healthy wild ecosystem, and that this is something I tell people in, in home orchards to consider, and you take some soil, you take away maybe the top inch or two of, of mulchy matter, and get some soil where you know roots are, because you have to have that affiliation with roots nearby to be picking up mycorrhizae. And you bring that back to an apple tree that you planted, but, but you didn't do the root dip thing I talked about earlier. Now, I'm not saying to you, okay, you made a mistake, dig up that tree, let's wash off the root systems and dip it in the gel and then get it back in there. No, what you need to do is just simply remove an inch or two of mulchy matter and get closer to where the roots of the fruit tree are and put that wild inoculum. I, I call this ent soil. I'm a I love those, the tree shepherds in the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien fantasy world of Middle Earth. Um, but end soil introduces the 20 to 50 mycorrhizal species that are in that wild ecosystem to where you're planting your fruit tree. And, and in this case, your fruit tree may be in a, a lawn setting where there's one or two species of endomycorrhizae going, but there's not the nine or 12 or 20. And, and these species of fungi have different principles. Some are really adept at getting going early in the season when the soil is cool. Others are there for the, the transition until the plant is more firmly established. Some have an expertise in, in bringing in manganese, let's say, or, or they're all phosphorus go-getters, but they have different nutrient specialties. And so you want that diversity. And, and that's where the commercial inoculums have value because... Different fungal species have different levels of sensitivity to disturbance, and we don't really know the big picture. We haven't, I, I think we've named something like 5% of the fungal species on the planet. So we, we mostly don't know much about this realm. Um, but when we get, want to reestablish these connections, bringing in the key players, the, the nine or 12 species that are in these different quality inoculums, can be an important step to recovery. And, and again, it's, it's, it's really about what's the history of that land? What is your cover crop cycle? Did you have bare ground? Was that followed by broccoli? 
and then buckwheat, and then did you plant cabbage again? And, and you start to get bigger and bigger distances in time from where spore inoculum is going to carry forward. That's where you need to come back and do things like inoculate the Dan graft, which has affiliation with about 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi. You'll get the most bang for your buck. And then in rotating your cover crops and chopping the organic matter, utilizing more surface decomposition, just integrating more reduced tillage thinking into how you go about your farming, you'll find very economical ways to, to carry forward mycorrhizal connection. There's times for inoculum and there's times when it isn't necessary. But all along the journey, we have to be thinking fungally. On that note, I think that's a that's a great place to to wrap up here, Michael. We're going to get a word from another sponsor before we go to our lightning round. We'll be right back with that in just a second. This lightning round and perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. In the wild, where our crop plants ancestors evolved their microbial mark partnerships, plants are provided with nutrients from the soil through the work of partner microbes in their employee, just like we're talking about in this episode. Wide-ranging roots reach out and grab an abundant supply of nutrients and contact a bunch of microbes, even in less than ideal conditions. But now that you go and stick that seed in a little tiny container, it has to get everything it needs right there in a few cubic centimeters of soil. By providing compost-based potting soils built on ingredients selected to create an environment that supports the growth of plants, chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients, Vermont Compost ensures that your plants have what they need consistently. Makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. VermontCompost.com. All right, and we're back and ready for the lightning round with Michael Phillips. Michael, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Oh, tough call, Chris. Um, I love my broad fork from Meadow Creature. Uh, big, heavy, broad fork, which is my way of aerating the soil and part of how I go about no tillage and yet being able to incorporate organic matter. And I also love my wheel hose. Um, I just enjoy r running down that row and I can shallow cultivate in a small garden setting between herb beds where there's just a one row planting to get into cover. It's very easy to incorporate cover crop seed with the, uh, the disc harrow attachment that Haas Tools puts on their wheel hoe. Um, I call a lot of this stuff biological equipment because if, if it works to maintain that fungal connection, it's sweet. And that's what you want to be working with. I'm going to take it that apples is your favorite crop to grow. But if we took apples away, what would be your favorite crop to grow? Ah! <laughs> um, if I didn't have the trees going, I really enjoy garlic. garlic. Garlic's a good medicine crop and it has these fungal connections. It's a plant that I utilize for so many different conditions, not guy conditions, but also just makes for great eating. And I grow these about eight different varieties. I get cloves the size of Brazil nuts. And a part of our income is selling seed garlic to pass on these varieties so other people can adapt them to where they are and, and we can all grow more garlic. Here we are in late winter. If you could tell every farmer listening to the show to do something this spring to enhance the Michael Reisel environment on their farm, what would it be? That whole notion of making that inoculum connection at the point of, of growing out seeds and, and getting your transplants ready, that's an opportunity that shouldn't be missed. Um, look at your rotation plan and maybe there's two moments of tillage in, in, in the season that you are looking at doing, can you cut one of them out? Is there a way to start to get into more non-disturbance techniques that are going to carry the, the fungal thing forward? And then when you plant your potato eyes, your spuds, inoculate them, you're going to have really happy potatoes. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? I'm sure I idled away 10, <laughs> 20 years learning how to um, work with fruit trees to understand the fungal connections are the beginning and the end point. So to accelerate that would be wonderful because it is such a long wait. And the more north you go, the, the more true this is to get that apple tree to have enough wood structure to be into its bearing years and, and up and running. 
I realized that I probably have, in truth, 50 or 60 opportunities to get it right each new spring. And that's not a whole lot to base your learning on when you really get into this. So I love the wisdom I, I seem to think I have right now. <laughs> and I would have loved to have had that earlier on so I could just get that much further along on the, the learning curve. But all in all, I'm doing okay. And it, it, it's a good life. And it's fun to be able to share a lot of these teachings with people and our collective learning curve. That's what I think is really kicking into gear in the, in these new days. Awesome. Michael, thank you so much for taking us on this fungal journey today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Chris. And I look forward to catching up with you again someday when I get out to teach in the Midwest. Great. Me too. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again, this is episode 108 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Phillips. That's P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Growing for Market, where you can get 20% off your subscription with the code PODCAST at checkout. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource that you value. You can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. And speaking of help, I'd like to start a tractor in thanks to Bob Blanchard, hey dad, and Jonathan Bruderlein for their support of the show. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep that tractor running.